This time, let me introduce uh, Professor Kip Viscusi. He is the John Kogan Professor of Law and Economics and Director of the Program on Empirical Legal Studies here at Harvard Law School. He is teaching a class at this time called Economics of Regulation and Antitrust, which is, and he also uh, has co-written a textbook by that same name, which is the leading textbook in the field. At this time, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the forum to introduce Professor Viscusi. You can tell it's an enthusiastic crowd when the, introdu when the introducer gets an applause as well. Um, I'm delighted to welcome back to Harvard Law School, Joel Klein, who's one of our most illustrious graduates. Uh, he graduated magna cum laude from the law school in 1971. Uh, after that, he clerked uh, for Chief Judge David Bazelon of the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, he also was a clerk for Supreme Court Justice uh, Lewis Powell. Uh, I'm often asked by students, how can you uh, do work on behalf of the public interest? And you can, can you combine that with work for uh, private law firms or work in private practice? And Joel Klein has been successful in, I think, doing both. Uh, after his clerkships, he did work for the Mental Health Law Project, for which he litigated several important cases on behalf of the mentally ill and the retarded. He's co-founder of the law firm Onik Klein and Farr, which specializes in complex litigation. His own areas of specialty include healthcare, constitutional litigation, antitrust law, and civil rights. In the Clinton administration, he's held a variety of positions. He was deputy counsel to the president from 1993 to 95. He was the principal deputy attorney general for the antitrust division from 95 to 96. He was then acting attorney general in 96 and then confirmed as attorney general in 97. Uh, for those of you who've been living in a cave for the past few years, uh, Joel Klein uh, launched the recent wave of litigation against Microsoft. Uh, when it first started, I thought all of this was intellectually interesting. All of this stuff about network, exter ne network externalities uh, was fascinating. But it was a question of, could anybody really take on Bill Gates? Uh, well, just, uh, Thomas Penfield Jackson gave us the answer that, in fact, you can take on Bill Gates and you can often win. Uh, and it's noteworthy that this current issue of Economist magazine, which is one of the last bastions of free enterprise, uh, proposed that the solution to the current litigation was the breakup of Microsoft. Uh, so I think we've certainly come a long way uh, during the past few years. Uh, the results of this litigation are going to have profound effects on the economy, uh, not just on uh, the uh, internet uh, system, not just on the computer industry, but on the economy more general. Generally, I'm delighted to introduce Joel Klein, who's going to tell us what these effects will be. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Viscusi, and I want to thank the law firm uh, for bringing me back here. I actually uh, was going to say I learned torts in this room, but that would be an exaggeration. I took torts in this room. <laughs> Um, and uh, federal courts as well, which I went on to teach. Uh, as Professor Viscusi uh, said, uh, you may have read that uh, I've been under some pressure lately. I just spent four months negotiating or mediating with uh, Chief Judge Posner, uh, which in and of itself is an experience. And uh, <clears throat> I'm about, uh, or so I read, to make a potentially important uh, decision uh, in the Microsoft case. So it, it's a really wonderful opportunity for me to kind of come back here. It's been 30, uh, close to 30 years. Uh, I have wonderful memories of this institution and uh, lots of friends are still here. And as I think about the issues of law enforcement and indeed the values that infuse public policy, it's so uh, wonderful for me to be at a place which really was the embryo for my own thinking on many of these issues. This is truly, I think, an extraordinary time in our nation's history, a time the dimensions of which we can't fully come to grasp with. The phenomenal wealth creation the growth of our economy, the technological developments, the globalization we are seeing are having effects that I believe are larger than anyone is capable of fully appreciating and that are going to raise some important questions for our society. By any measure, we are looking at 
unimaginable in certain heretofore unimaginable expansions of wealth and economic opportunity. Just to, just to give a few examples, right now in the United States, our current growth rate exceeds 5%, unemployment's at 4%, and inflation is virtually non-existent. You know, up until quite recently, the economists told us that was inconceivable. Those sets of events could not occur simultaneously. The amount of money that flows in the capital markets now, again, is orders of magnitude and profoundly different than things we would imagine. Just again, a simple comparison. The last year of George Bush's presidency, the total dollar amount of mergers and acquisitions in the United States was about $70 billion. This year, the last year of Clinton's administration, the total amount is likely to be $2 trillion or about 30 times as high. Indeed, we've got several mergers today, single mergers, that are more than the entire amount, more than 70 billion, more than the entire amount in the last year of the Bush administration. Now, there's a great deal, obviously, to cheer about. And while I didn't want to come up here and be a naysayer, I just want to make sure that the good news doesn't blind us to some of the fundamental realities about the nature of markets and the role and responsibility of government. When Alan Greenspan concluded, when he coined the term a couple of years ago, quote, irrational exuberance, he was talking about the stock market. But I think the concept has a potentially broader reach today. The wealth creation we are experiencing has led to a kind of let the good times roll attitude among large segments of our society. And okay, I'll admit it. It's been a hell of a party. It is a hell of a party. The food, terrific. The wine, plentiful. The music, inspiring. I just wonder a little bit how we're going to feel about it when we wake up tomorrow morning. But I'm getting ahead of my story, and I want to step back first. Let me start with the good news, because I think there really is a lot of it and a lot to celebrate. At its core, and this is profound, we've come as a society, indeed, throughout the world to understand the importance of a basic economic concept that Adam Smith and my friends at The Economist laid out a couple of centuries ago, that a free market con economy works best for wealth creation and economic advancement. For the past two centuries, Smith has had many challengers who took him on and argued he was wrong. Today, not just in the United States, but really throughout the world, the Smith view is now widely accepted. Now, when you think about it, this is really amazing. When I was here in law school, this would have been one of the great debated topics of our time. Indeed, not so long ago, there was a robust debate about state-run versus private economies. But today, almost no one talks about or argues in favor of socialist or communist theory as viable organizing principles for an economy. Even at the Harvard Law School, those kind of theories are in decline. Less quaint, but also now largely discredited, is the old European model, focusing on protecting national champions and sometimes even giving state aid to private enterprise so that your companies could become the great global powerhouse. A variant and considerably more aggressive version of that theme characterized the strong Asian economies of uh, recent time, which were in no small part government-organized enterprise exemplified by the Keiretsu in Japan or the Chaibo in Korea. Indeed, I can remember only a handful, seven, eight years ago, books and conferences repeatedly touting that the next century, that is the 21st century, was going to be the Asian century. No more. Today, the US economy, driven by rapid technological expansion, is really the envy of the world. Whether it's computing, the rollout of increased bandwidth in communications, the new technological infrastructure, the internet or biotechnology, and many other fields, UN, US companies are at the cutting edge of the global juggernaut. In this environment, it's entirely understandable that the worshipers of private enterprise are celebrating. They, indeed everyone, should be doing so. The potential of the free market is great, and I believe holds out enormous hope for the future. But what concerns me is that some purveyors of market-based thinking take a second step, a very ill-advised step. 
arguing that the government should get out of the way altogether and things will only get better and better. I agree with part of this theory, but only a part of it. And I think getting this right is absolutely critical. I've long thought what David Jurgen, in his recent book, Commanding Heights, called command and control government regulation could not keep pace with the kind of racket, rapid economic expansion we're now experiencing. But we must be careful. And here I fear even thoughtful people sometimes get confused. We must be careful to understand the difference between command and control regulation on the one hand and antitrust enforcement on the other. Because as I'll now argue, the fact that we should jettison the former is all the more reason that we need to protect and engage the latter. So that we're clear, command and control regulation is the kind of thing that was exemplified by what we saw with the airlines prior to deregulation, or indeed the ATT monopoly before the Justice Department broke it up in the mid-1980s. These were industries where the government attempted to set the price and describe the terms of service or engagement. And fundamentally, I believe the problems with these attempts is that they are far too cumbersome and have far too many unintended consequences to work efficiently. I believe that 30 years ago. And if you think of the rapidity with which the economy currently moves, how much truer that is today. But the fact, that fact doesn't lead to the conclusion, as some have touted, that the government should get out of the way altogether. Indeed, and this is also significant, Adam Smith recognized this fundamental point as well, even though some of his contemporary disciples declined to do so. What Smith recognized is that ultimately, the success of markets, of the free market, depends on those markets remaining competitive, and that left alone, markets will not remain competitive. Smith actually put the point quite graphically in a quote that I think was the uh, sort of original concept that led to the antitrust laws. And Smith said, quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion. What a wonderful phrase, merriment and diversion. But the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. That concern is every bit as real today as it was when Adam Smith wrote. Technology changes, surely, and markets change, surely but human nature doesn't really change. And businesses today, just like their predecessors, have every incentive in the world to collude rather than compete, to abuse market power rather than to engage on the merits. And if the government steps aside, I assure you, that is precisely what is going to happen. And it's that basic recognition, that Smith concept dressed up in modern terms that is really at the heart of the antitrust laws. The core value that we're about is preserving competition. And a central tenet is that one way, the only way in which businesses should be allowed to enjoy market power is through developing superior products or through, through lowering their costs and therefore being able to reduce their prices. Those principles are every bit as true today as when Smith wrote or in 1890 when the Sherman Act was passed. Now, those who disagree essentially argue two things. The ex extreme, and I think quite remarkable view, that there's never been a need for antitrust enforcement at all. So this, this laissez-faire time is a great time to get rid of it altogether. And then a somewhat more modest view that there's things are different in the new economy. It moves too rapidly. It's the new economy. And therefore, we need to change the antitrust laws if not abandon them altogether. Now I want to respond to each of these arguments in turns. From my own parochial point of view, perhaps the most remarkable thing I've witnessed is that supposedly thoughtful scholars and commentators have actually called for the total abolition of the antitrust laws, even in instances involving classic cartel behavior. That is, situations where direct competitors agree on prices and divvy up markets. The only purpose for this behavior is to increase the profits to the businesses at the expense of consumers. It is quite simply theft by well-dressed thieves. 
Now, this is not a small or inconsequential matter. This is not something that happens infrequently, even with the antitrust laws on the books. Beginning about a half a dozen years ago, the antitrust division launched a major initiative to crack several large international cartels in industries where we had reason to believe they existed, typically commodity markets characterized by a handful of major, major global players who were feeling the pinch of competition that was resulting through the breakdown of international trade barriers. Our first major case involved lysine, a feed additive that farmers use to feed their livestock. While the product was not sexy, obviously, the amount of commerce was significant, involving seven, several hundred millions of dollars a year in the United States alone. And one of the major players in this cartel was Archer Daniels Midland, known to most of you as the supermarket to the world. We caught a break when one of their employees agreed to cooperate with us by videoing and audio taping cartel meetings and related discussions. Based on that evidence, the cartel members pled guilty and senior executives at several companies did jail time. Indeed, ABM, ADM itself paid us a hundred million dollar fine and two very high level executives are now serving two year prison sentences in federal prison in Illinois. At one point, I just want to stop. A lot of people say, well, this is low level, mid level management. We're talking top level company executives in all of these matters. Following ADM, we cracked several other major international cartels, usually with the help of significant cooperation by one of the major players. We secured hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of fine. We went from an annual fine level of about $40 million a year to over a billion last year. And people question my commitment to private markets. I've made absolutely clear the antitrust division has a budget of $100 million. Last year, we brought $1.2 billion into the Treasury. If I could, I would take us private in a second. It would be one of the great IPOs of the modern time. Now, the most prominent of these cases was one we just broke open quite recently involving a remarkable, sophisticated, long-standing effort, long effort to fix prices allocate markets and rig bids on household vitamins that we all ingest, either directly or through other food products like cereals. The major players in this cartel were three powerhouse European companies, household names in Europe and indeed even here, Hoffman La Roche, EASF, and Rhone Polanc. I mean, this is not the second string we're dealing with. The latter, Rhone Polanc cooperated with us and was uh, it wasn't, uh, cooperated with us, uh, but Hoffman LaRoche paid a fine of $500 million, BASF $225 million, and several European nationals are now doing prison time in the United States as a result of it. Now, despite these outcomes, significant major companies involved in enormous price gouging, we still hear criticism from scholars and popular writers who say we should scrap this effort that we're picking on misguided or ill-informed business executives, or perhaps a couple of especially aggressive competitors. This is my favorite. Indeed, right after the ADM guilty pleas, a prominent newspaper ran a column on its op-ed page entitled, and this is not a joke, quote, hey Joel, this is the land of the free, in which I was whacked for having prissy notions about business ethics. And only last month, that same columnist, again, took after the antitrust division, arguing that price fixing was, quote, a figmentary crime, close quote, involving nothing more than, quote, an information exchange between consenting adults, close quote. <laughs> and I've even seen supposedly serious scholars still arguing that these cartels are in inherently unstable and have no effect on prices. So we guys at the antitrust division should just lighten up. Well, I got to tell you, I agree that cartel behavior involves consenting adults, but the people getting screwed are the consuming public who most assuredly hasn't consented. The evidence we have gathered in case after case shows that these cartels are not unstable, but very enduring in vitamins. One of the participants called it vitamins, Inc. One we cracked last uh, year, endured for 17 years before we broke it open, and the vitamins cartel was a decade old when we uh, prosecuted it. 
Nor are these ineffectual or delusional efforts by sophisticated businesses that are risking huge fines and prison sentences for behavior, as you read in a paper, that can have no effect on their bottom line. We have lots of evidence on that issue as well. In one case, the evidence showed that the cartel members were able to increase prices by 60% during the course of the conspiracy. In the Lysine case I mentioned, prices went up by 70% in the first year of the cartel alone. Now, despite these numbers, it's actually one time when a picture is truly worth a thousand words. I think some of you are saying, well, why didn't you spare us a thousand words? But as I said earlier, in the cartel case, in the Lysine case, ADM and several foreign companies were involved. ADM was a big player in this. We had a cooperating witness, the only time in antitrust history, who video and audio taped cartel meetings. Just this past Friday, the department made a determination to release those tapes at the American Bar Association antitrust meeting because they thought we thought they were a valuable aid in counseling clients. And I would just like to take a few minutes to show you some of the excerpts this afternoon. What you're about to see is really quite, quite remarkable. It will show you something about the brazenness and the sophistication of these participants. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you, I've got this thing for you. Let's see. One thing I can't afford to be is technologically clumsy here, so I've got to <laughs> make sure this works. The meeting I'm going to start with, I'm going to show you excerpts from a few meetings, was attended by executives from the world's five dominant Lyceum producers. They took efforts to conceal their arrival. They're actually at a trade association of all their customers. This is like a large global trade association. They pretend to be having trade association meetings themselves, formal agendas and the like. In order to protect their cartel meetings, they don't arrive at the hotel at the same time. They stagger their entry. And as you'll see, there's some empty seats at the table while this is being filmed. And one of the questions is, who's going to sit there? And two of the people mentioned, one ConAgra and another, uh, another is Tyson's Food, are actually the largest purchases of this lysine commodity. Let me start by putting on the machine and seeing if we can Coffee, yeah. Thank you. Please feel free to help yourself. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Moving yeah. forward. Okay. We have the glasses. That's some lesson. No, that's Matt here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, welcome to to Atlanta, USA. I'm glad you could come here. We've been off so often to Asia, so often to Europe. It's uh, good that everybody could come here at some point. I think Kanji. I think Kanji's going to pretty much lead the meeting. And obviously, the topic here at the beginning would be, I think, more volume related because price is going to start at 10:30. <laughs> now it's a, we're gonna we're gonna keep it on. Sometimes uh, how do you stop this? In regarding our in regarding our next meeting, yeah. I think in our next meeting, since you guys hosted the Vancouver meeting, I think ABM should host the next meeting, don't you think? Yeah, that's fine. All right, before we go to that, the knock at the door in the last one actually was an FBI agent disguised as a hotel employee returning the cooperating witnesses briefcase. In another one of these tapes, ADM, the president of ADM, summing up his company's attitude toward its customers, said, he, told, he said that <clears throat> at our company, we have a slogan that, quote, penetrates the whole company, quote, our competitors are our friends, our customers are the enemy. This from the supermarket to the world. Now, the other thing that's amazing, you see this awareness about the FD, FBI and all this. These people actually know that the US is aggressive in this kind of enforcement area. And here you see a phone call where they don't want to come to the United States because they're afraid if they get caught here, the penalties will be particularly severe. In uh, Maui. Maui? The YC, you know, have the YC meeting, the group meeting like we had last time in Vancouver. The group YC meeting to have it in Maui, Hawaii. Maui, Hawaii is uh, still the United States. Yeah, but what's that mean? Still the United States? Still the United States means the United States is uh, very severe for the control of antitrust activity, no? Yeah, but you think in a, in a hotel in Hawaii next to an 18 old golf course? <laughs> no, oh, if your company judge, no problem, maybe I will consult with the uh, legal department. Well, you know, we met Cuba. We met Cuba in Hawaii. Maui, about a year ago. I know, ago, one I to one is all right, but this kind of, oh, well, maybe we can call it the association for the establishment of the association. Yeah, that's right, it be a combo association. Maui, Maui is very convenient for us, but uh, I don't know. If, if for one, it'd be a formal association meeting, the, the starting of our association, and also would be a good distance for you and us, both that's together. Right. That's right. Or about halfway for each of us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And they own the golf course, I think. Yeah. Uh, no big problem. And I think your country owns Hawaii anyway, so. So, uh, well, anyway, I will get the advice from our legal department. Okay, we got, we got time on that. That meeting wasn't going to happen until one, we figured out the mechanics of the association first, and two, to make sure these prices really go up. All right, now I'm going to show you quickly just three more of these excerpts to actually see the way these cartels work and the rapidity with which they fix prices, divide markets. The first segment actually shows the efforts they take because their lawyers want to know what they're doing at their association meetings. They, these are companies with antitrust compliance programs. The efforts they take, we've got actual programs, agendas from these meetings, all of which are made up. Then the second segment is a cartel meeting in which they do price and the third market allocation. And I'll, I'll just let it run and you get a flavor for it. Even some of the nuance. This is that meeting in Hawaii that they set up. Uh, 
Verlag und auch nicht mit unserer Mini-Programmierung. Also ich bin hier. Many commercial people and some similar people. Right? And we have to really discuss the real matter. Right? And maybe next day we will have a price talk. Right? Uh, but our name is really on. Yeah. It is the purpose of association or how it's done for those of you who don't have the complete education. Uh, well, you know, they, you a contribution. What is it? What is the charge? Seventy-two cents, isn't it? Yeah. Seventy-four, is it? Hmm. Seventy-two now? Yeah. Well, we can go. Seventy-four. Seventy-four. Seventy-two. Seventy-four. Number seventy-four. Seventy-four. That was sixteen. Seventy-four cents. Dollar sixteen. Oh, that's that's right. In the dollar twenty is the mm. less truck load truck. Okay, so twenty-five. Minimum. I don't think it was truck load. Truck load. Dollar twenty-four. Yes. For for Canada, three forty-five. I think with the price for today, this is what we ought to push for. I mean, it's three fifteen, three twenty right now. I think you go to 355, it's a little heavy right now. In my opinion. Right. From tomorrow. From tomorrow. It's already night time in Canada. Not on the way, sir. USA. <laughs> all right, all right. USA. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. USA would be the same story. <clears throat> well, instead of pinpointing a lot of examples, one of like I told you, we made some mistakes too in USA. Three, and, and we took care of it. We died of doing that. USA, I think we ought to go back, you know, our target was a dollar twenty. We ought to get it back on target. How far below our target? At least ten cents. No, I would go to a dollar twenty. Well, uh, I think that's a little bit, uh, you were mentioning for you, I think. Well, this is a dollar sixteen right here in Canada. Yeah, maybe yeah. we should have said about the uh, result of one fifteen, one sixteen. At the same price from the States and Canada. But going back to 120, 10 cents up. Delivered price, full truck, 116. You agree? Oh, dollar 16. Full truck, dollar 16. Which is the course by that same thing in Canada. Right. Then we are equal to the river. Oh, delivered. Everybody works on the river. Yes, anybody. Two with the number. Full truck, bro. Absolute. Absolute. Check here tomorrow. There are more of different. We have fourteen thousand tons of oil in one year. There are more like that of different meetings where they set <clears throat> market allocations, how many, how much new growth there was. You start with last year's amount, you add the 44,000 tons of new growth get divided up, how they discipline each other, if there's any cheating uh, that goes on, and, and so forth. Now, the point I want to emphasize, and remember this, is what you were watching. Shut this thing off.
Joseph. What you were just watching took place by people who knew their behavior was illegal and who knew they risked substantial penalties to themselves and their company. Can you imagine what kind of behavior we would be witnessing if this sort of thing were not illegal? Now I want to turn my focus to a more modest proposal that's being bandied about a great deal today in some quarters. That is that sure, we ought to do cartel enforcement, but there's no role for antitrust in the new economy. That the antitrust laws are too old and out of date, that technology moves too rapidly, and that consequently, attempts at anti-competitive behavior in these markets will not have any effect. These kinds of arguments, sometimes coupled with some truly silly notions about the motives of people uh, like myself who file these cases, have filled the libertarian press in the wake of the antitrust division's case against Microsoft. These are interesting theoretical arguments, and I have been and continue to be prepared to respond on a theoretical basis, pointing out that market power and barriers to entry are as sought after in the new economy as they were in the old, that because of network effects and positive feedback loops, market power will often be achievable in the new economy in ways that were much less available in the old, and that the likely impact will be felt much more in terms of innovation than on price, but that the ultimate effect on consumers will be substantial. I've also pointed out that dominant or monopoly positions can indeed be very enduring. Look at the Windows position on the de desktop in terms of its dominance, or look at how dominant MasterCard and Visa have been in the credit card industry, another monopoly case that we have brought. And indeed, that this dominance can be readily leveraged into adjacent or related markets, thereby increasing the monopolist power and making entry even more difficult. Finally, I've argued that there is no need to change our antitrust laws because they're common law statutes and the concerns they speak to, market power, how it is acquired, and how it is used or abused, are at the heart of a competitive economy today just as they were a century ago. To be sure, as I said before, technology differs and new market mechanism, like the internet, for example, require that the antitrust division do very fact-intensive analyses and also caution us to err on the side of non-intervention before we challenge behaviors or mechanisms that we're uncertain about. But that said, the antitrust laws state broad principles, just like the First Amendment. They can and should be interpreted to meet changing circumstances precisely because they rest on a series of fundamental principles that are readily adaptable to new events, much like the free speech and free press clauses of the First Amendment were enacted at a time when we only had the print media and public square, and yet they've been successfully applied to all of the new media, including TV and radio. Fortunately for me, however, there's no need to engage these issues anymore solely on a theoretical basis. On the contrary, I believe the trial in Microsoft provides a great deal of information about the appropriate way to think about these issues. The court heard extensive evidence in that case about market power, exclusionary and predatory behavior in the high-tech industry. There were 78 days of testimony from leading industry players, predominantly from Microsoft, but from Netscape, Sun Microsystems, Apple, Intuit, Intel, IBM, and AOL plus thousands of pages of deposition testimony from other key industry players and thousands and thousands of documents, principally from Microsoft's own files. Now, in that trial, the court made 208 pages of fact-finding. And if you haven't read it, you're doing yourself a disservice because so much of this case is based on TV, and newspaper reporting, and spin, and what have you. And the facts are there to be read, supported by this massive body of evidence. And in this respect, I'm particularly pleased to quote President Reagan, who said, facts are stubborn things. If you go through the court's opinion, it tells a story, something along the following lines. In Microsoft's Monopoly desktop position, which the court finds to be a monopoly, is based on the 90% market share that has been long and durable, 
despite very high margins, which should usually in business be a magnet for new entrants. But the court found that new entrants face substantial barriers in this market because of the network effects and positive feedback loop. Essentially, as the market develops, the more operating systems you have out there, the more applications written to your operating system. The more applications written, the more it makes your operating system valuable and you sell more operating systems. And so you get this positive feedback loop that enables you to really have an entrenched market position. And people who come at you directly, such as IBM with OS2, a matter of some testimony in this case, find that they're unable to get the requisite applications, that the applications that are ported to their OS are ported later, and customers find they want the latest and the newest and the greatest first, and so forth and so on. So a direct entry into the market seemed futile. It couldn't be supported by IBM, and in a decade of high margins, hadn't been supported by anyone else. So a new strategy, which people in the business world thought about, which of course found based on the evidence, was to try to develop some killer app that would have real market penetration and create it as a layer of middleware on a cross-platform basis. So it would run on the Mac and it would run on uh, uh, Unix and Linux and uh, uh, Microsoft and so forth. In other words, build a layer of APIs north of the various operating systems and hope that people will write to your APIs. And of course, the browser being the kind of technology it was, this held out the promise. Now, this isn't a matter of theory. The documents are clear from Microsoft's own files. And the court quotes these documents from Bill Gates saying that basically Netscape is trying to, quote, commoditize the operating system by developing a cross-platform technology through the browser, exposing APIs. And in Gates' words again, he says, basically, our core asset was at stake in this strategy. Now, here's the important point, and again, these are factual findings. The tactics used to defeat Netscape, and indeed cross-platform Java and several other uh, uh, products, were classic predatory exclusionary antitrust tactics. There was nothing new here. Sure, the means of implementation were new, but the tactics went back to the earliest antitrust cases. Exclusive dealing, one of the fundamental ones throughout this case. Tying throughout this case. <clears throat> uh, predatory pricing and expenditures. The expenditure of resources not to earn a return, but to protect a monopoly or to create and foster a monopoly through the returns. In other words, something that would be irrational other than, in this case, to protect your monopoly. These are as I say, the kind of tactics that we have seen in antitrust from as far back as you can go, withholding significant information, technical information, which happened in this case, which was a big issue in ATT, in uh, some of the old Kodak cases, and, and so forth. So this was nothing new. And indeed, as I said, it was not limited to company, to, to Netscape, it extended, as the court found, to Sun, Intel, Apple, IBM, and real networks, a whole raft of independent software vendors. Now, there were a lot of issues in the press about tying and you know, technology and new products and so forth. But again, this is not a matter of theory. This is why you have trials. This is why you have Microsoft's documents, why you have expert testimony, why you have people in the industry who experience this to sort it out. And the record is quite, quite clear. Take, for example, the difference between a Polaroid camera where you basically integrate the film and the camera into a single product. That is an integration that has consumer benefit. That is very different from taking a camera in which you have monopoly power and forcing people to buy your own separate roll of film by essentially tying it onto it. And the question in this case was a question of fact as to whether this was a, if you will, bolting of two products together, the browser and the Windows operating system, or there was some form of technological integration such that the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. And the court made elaborate findings on it, critical findings based significantly on Microsoft's own evidence. Their senior technologist, one of the three or four senior people in the company, wrote an email talking about 
this particular problem. That is, Netscape had a first mover advantage, and he says, quote, I don't understand how IE, that is Internet Explorer, is going to win. The current path is simply to copy everything that Netscape does packaging and product-wise. Let's suppose IE is as good as Navigator Communicator. Who wins? The one with the 80% share. Maybe be, being free helps us, but once people are used to a product, it is hard to change them. Then he says, listen to this, consider Office. We are more expensive today, and we're still winning. My conclusion is that we must leverage Windows more. Treating IE as an add-on, which is cross-platform, means losing our biggest advantage, Windows market share. He then goes on in a subsequent memo to say, you see market share, browser market share, as job number one. And he makes clear, he's not talking about technology. He said, we are not leveraging Windows from a marketing perspective. He says, if you agree that Windows is a huge asset, pages of testimony and evidence on this particular issue. And the question of whether there is an integration of technological significance or a tie that amounts to a bolt was answered by the court in its findings of fact. Same kind of issue on intimidation. Here's another finding, Microsoft document relied on by the trial court. This is a situation in which Intel had a product called native signal processing that Microsoft didn't want loaded by the OEMs, the computer manufacturers. And so Microsoft basically decided that it would instruct all the OEMs who are dependent on Windows to not load the Intel product. In other words, they put the word out into the uh, OEM channel, and it says, basically, don't load the Intel NSP or else. And then, based on a phone call with Andy Grove, Gates reports to his senior executives, quote, Intel feels we have all the OM OEMs on hold with our NSP chill. He adds, this is good news, says Gates, because it means OEMs are listening to us. Andy Grove believes Intel is living up to its part of the NSP bargain, that is not putting it out, and that we should let OEMs know that some of the new software work that they're doing is okay. If Intel is not totally sticking to its part of the deal, let me know. There's nothing about the new economy here. This is straightforward intimidation. Same kind of things on predatory pricing and predatory expenditure. Court made all the findings. Browser share was, quote, number one at Microsoft. Why? It was a no-revenue product. Their own documents say it was a no-revenue product. Why was it uh, a number one uh, company concern? Why did they spend all the money to develop it, all the money to distribute it, to buy exclusionary contracts? Why did they spend all the money to get AOL and other companies a bounty to switch people over? There were tons of evidence. They did it because they knew that if the Netscape browser took hold, it could create this middleware platform that would, quote, commoditize Windows. And you could go through all of the charges in this case and you would see that these are traditional antitrust violations. Let me also, and then the court, of course, went on at some length at the end, people have said about consumer harm. And the court details for three or four pages the real consumer harms here. The slowing of computers, the reduction of choice, uh, the elimination of, uh, of people who wanted browserless machines and so forth. And he goes through the whole thing and ends with what I think is one of the most powerful but accurate findings in the whole case. Paragraph 412, most harmful of all is the message that Microsoft's actions have conveyed to every enterprise with the potential to innovate in the computer industry. Through its conduct toward Netscape, IBM, Compaq, Intel, and others, Microsoft has demonstrated that it will use its prodigious market power and immense profits to harm any firm that insists on pursuing initiatives that could intensify competition against one of Microsoft's core products. Microsoft's past success in hurting such companies and stifling innovation deters investment in technologies and businesses that exhibit the potential threat to Microsoft. The ultimate result is that some innovations that would truly benefit consumers never occur for the sole reason 
that they do not coincide with Microsoft's self-interest. I think that is absolutely critical. And people say, where's the consumer harm? There are specific harms, but the real consumer harm is the deterring of innovation because people will not have the opportunity. They won't take the risks to have what happened to Netscape and cross-platform Java and native signal processing and the other things that the court refers to in its decision. And let me also clarify one other point that a lot of people in the press have talked about it with, I think, a fair amount of confusion. The argument goes that technology markets move too quickly for us to keep up, that the browser war at issue in Microsoft is yesterday's news. But that really misses the point. Whatever one's view of the going forward viability of browsers or cross-platform Java or the other technologies at issue at the trial, the important point is that Microsoft's dominance on the desktop and its ability to use that dominance to impair future innovations are every bit as real today as it was five years ago. If Microsoft plays by the rules and doesn't use the conventional means of violating the antitrust laws, tying, uh, withholding technical information, engaged in exclusive contracts, uh, disadvantaging its competitors who need to interconnect with it, et cetera, et cetera, then innovation will flourish. And it's entirely possible that is a critical Microsoft document said with respect to the browser, the Windows monopoly will be ended and operating system competition will uh, be enjoyed. But if Microsoft is allowed to continue these very same practices in the future, take voice recognition, for example, obviously going to be a key technology, then once again, innovation will be stifled and consumers will be hurt. And in that regard, let me just read to you a quote from the chief operating officer of Microsoft published by Bloomberg on January 9th, 1998, during our original consent decree case. He was asked, quote, what he would do, he was asked what, whether a small software company could compete on products that Microsoft plans to fold into its Windows operating system. In other words, could a new upstart company, how would they compete if Microsoft was going to fold its version of it like it did with the browser into Windows? And this is what the CEO of Microsoft, COO of Microsoft said. He said that that company probably should, quote, not go into business to begin with. Because, hey, if you're a betting person, you know which way it's going to go, close quote. Now, that's my story, and they're sticking to it. Now, I want to be clear. This case is not over. There's a remedy phase coming up soon in the district court, and Microsoft said it intends to appeal. We have confidence in our case and in the district court's ruling, and we look forward to an expeditious resolution at the appellate level. My only concern is that the case stay in the courts where it belongs. Law enforcement should be based on facts and law, not on public relations campaigns, political contributions, or push polls. That's what the rule of law is all about and why we as a nation inscribe the words, quote, equal justice under law over the entrance to our Supreme Court. It's inherent in the nature of antitrust enforcement that our targets are often wealthy and influential companies. During my tenure, we have sued some of America's most powerful firms, including Archer Daniels Midland, General Electric, and Lockheed Martin, without political recrimination. That is the way it should be. Now, in the time that we're and remains, I want to just focus, if I can find my paper here. I want to focus on a broader point and some of what really concerns me about our current preoccupation with wealth creation. Again, so I'm not misunderstood or misquoted, I believe competitive markets work best and that wealth creation is an important desideratum in terms of societal goals and development. And I applaud what is going on in the global economy and the role that America is playing in that arena. 
But I am genuinely worried that in too many areas, in too many parts of our society, wealth creation is not simply an important desideratum, it's becoming the only desideratum. There's a growing obsession with wealth, illustrated, for example, by TV shows, which are always a pretty good indicator of popular culture, called things like greed, or worse, how to marry a millionaire, with the principal objection to the latter show apparently being that the guy was only worth $2 million. Can you imagine that, putting a pauper on network TV? Most troubling is the fact that despite, despite the enormous wealth creation we are experiencing, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is growing, not just in America, but throughout the world, a point that's now reduced to the soundbite in the phrase digital divide. And yet, we don't seem terribly concerned about this gap. We're not prepared to address it in any serious way. But if we're not prepared to deal with it now, when we are as rich as we are, when are we going to address it? And if we end up with two Americas, one rich and one impoverished, one filled with hope, the other with, with despair, will we then be, deserve to be proud of what we have achieved? And that brings me finally to the role of government. Governments are out of fashion these days. Everyone seems so excited about starting his or her own dot com. Indeed, one of the most jolting, though informative experiences I've recently had was when I taught a class of computer science students at a major Northeast university. After about 45 minutes, a student raised his hand. And when I called on, he said, quote, I don't get it. You're obviously smart, and yet, yet you're with the government. What's that about? Close quote. <laughs> now, I appreciated the compliment. But how sad, how sad if people, especially people who are fortunate enough to get into a first-rate computer science program, don't understand that a free market without a solid democratic foundation and without adherence to the rule of law will result in the kind of sordid, corrupt abuses that we now see in places like Russia, where there's rampant free marketism, then we truly will pay an enormous price. And let me be clear here, this is not a question about Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative. This is about realizing that public service is and must remain the highest and the best calling. For all the opportunities that the new technologies will create, they will also present us with enormously important issues of public policy. Some of those, like privacy, taxation, law enforcement on the net, not to mention the digital divide or the enormously complex issues that are gonna grow out of the biotechnology advances are gonna really stretch us as a country. And what we need to be sure of is that the people who are making those decisions are not the second team. Not the people who you so often see who go into government for self-promotion or advancement, but people who understand, as Franklin Roosevelt did, that those to whom so much has been given must be prepared to give back. And if our culture becomes so awash in wealth to the point where we become blinded to this fundamental historical imperative, then we will end up being poor in the things that matter most. So let me end by urging you to understand something I learned when I was a student 30 years ago here, that regardless of what you choose to do when you leave, always remember it is in our interest and your interest to promote respect for public service. And I would hope go further and try to plan a personal tour of duty for yourself. Thank you very much. Mr. Klein has graciously agreed to answer questions. Since we are running a little long, please uh, be concise and do wait for uh, the microphones. Thank you. Yes, sir.
uh, Eagle School called Cambridge, 3,000 miles across the water. We have in the European uh, and in the UK a somewhat parallel situation. Not totally parallel. Does the Justice Department have any evidence that similar action is proposed by the authorities in Brussels and in London? S similar action in what, what specific respects? Um, in pursuing Microsoft. The European Union, uh, their, their competition authority, which is called DG Comp, has announced that they are looking at Windows 2000 uh, and have an ongoing investigation. That is a matter of public record and uh, that is all I know about it. Sir. And you talked about concerted agreements and the new economy, so I'd like to put the two together for a question for you. Um, we see that in the, in the new economy for technological products, competitors often have to get together to set a standard, technological standards that the products can talk to each other. Uh, but we also see that sometimes when they get together, they slip in standards that are harmful to consumers or allegedly do so. And to give you an example, uh, there's a lot of talk right now about the DVD players that the motion picture, motion picture companies got together, developed DVD, great product, digital movies, but then they slipped in region codes uh, that divide the market so that if you buy a DVD in Europe, you can't play it on a US player and vice versa. How does the government go about, or should the government go about, uh, separating out legitimate standard setting from anti-competitive standard setting in a new economy? We do it routinely. I obviously won't comment on any specific case, but we have probably a handful of business reviews each year on standard setting, in which people lay out all the criteria, whether they, uh, you know, uh, what procedures they observe, et cetera, how they deal with cross patent uh, licensing and so on. Uh, and we issue uh, rulings on their likely pro-competitive or uh, if we have problems, anti-competitive natures. Standard setting is probably one of the two or three most complex issues in antitrust uh, enforcement. And as we move forward in the new economy, it's going to become more and more of an issue because interconnection it's going to become more and more critical. But the basic principles of this are sort of pretty well laid out as to what the ground rules are for what are pro-competitive standard setting, both in terms of process and substance, and what are likely to be anti-competitive. Supreme Court decision in Allied Tube speaks to this. I actually gave a speech at an IP conference on this about uh, two years ago. It's an important issue, but there are pretty good guidelines on how to deal with it. Yes, sir. How you doing, Charlie? Nice to see you here. <laughs> nice to be here. I'm, I'm curious what you think your chances are of successfully getting a, a fast track appeal to the Supreme Court. And if that doesn't happen, whether you think there's anything you can do to make sure that your successors in the department pursue the case as vigorously as you have. Well, that's uh, getting the cart a little bit ahead of the horse. Uh, so I, I, I probably. Uh, Discretion ought to be the better part of valor. We'll, we'll see where we are at the end of the remedy phase, uh, which the judge has moved expeditiously. Obviously, the department, and I believe any professional department, will seek to move the case quickly. I think it's in everyone's interest. I think it's in the nation's interest. I think it's in Microsoft's interest, and it's in the department's interest to move the case expeditiously. One of the things I was most taken with was an antitrust case of this magnitude and this significance, probably certainly not since ATT has there been one like this, moved from the filing of complaint through the rulings on the law in two years. And I think that's quite a tribute to the district court. It says something about the ability of the courts to move in reasonable time. In the past, that's the kind of thing that could have taken like IBM eight to 10 years and truly have rendered the whole thing obsolete. So my hope is that the American courts will continue to remain vigilant, understanding that it is important for all parties to get an expeditious resolution. In the back. Microsoft case needs to be brought up on the territory and the part of the country. Second, if you go back to the potential when Microsoft realized.
that Netscape was a was a challenge. They said if they have first mover advantage, they'll capture eighty percent of the market. I guess I'm curious about the theoretical role of first mover advantage. For instance, if Netscape, knowing they had the first mover advantage, took it with the intent to capture that eighty percent, is that monopolization? No. First mover advantage is entirely lawful and people do it. You see it happening on the web all the time today. The real question is what are the barriers to entry for second and third uh, movers and uh, that we don't know the answer to. There's an argument which may be that you may see serial monopoly uh, in some high tech industries, but serial monopoly is going to be much more dynamic than static monopoly. And I think it's far too early to conclude that there's going to be serial monopoly. There's no reason why you can't have uh, if the Linux uh, operating system or uh, OS2 were to get traction, you can't have uh, operating systems and cross-platform applications. So I think it's early in that regard. On the whole theory of predatory pricing and so forth, I want to make two things clear. A lot of people in the press now are sort of making this argument, you know, now Microsoft, tomorrow, this one, that one, this one, that one. That's the wrong view of the world. I suspect antitrust in the 21st century will be important but quite modest. And I suspect it will depend on whether you see the business practices that you saw in this case, not on whether you see market power, because you will see the acquisition of market power. Its duration, paradoxically, will depend on whether you compete on the merits or you don't. So I'm actually a big believer in innovation and leapfrog technologies. I think this case, but the more important case on predatory pricing and predatory strategies is our case against American Airlines, which I think really will answer your question, uh, because there, what you essentially have is, is buried entry through the network hub, where you have the same kind of increasing returns to scale and positive feedback loop. The more flights that congregate in a particular airline hub, the more likely it is that people can get quick transfers, move in, move out, the more likely people will acquire uh, frequent flyer miles. And what happened in that case was when a new entrant came in, essentially American flooded the market and priced at a very low number to the point where it kept adding capacity so that it would take the new entry below its break-even point. And what you saw in these routes is really quite remarkable, was you'd have during the new entrance portion in the market, fares would be half as high and twice as many people would travel, like from Wichita to Dallas, which is critical to the economic development of Wichita. As soon as American took them out of the market, the fares doubled, half as many people traveled. So if that doesn't make out a successful case of predatory pricing and capacity, uh, then, I, then I really will be concerned on the side here. You spoke a little bit about uh, public relations by big firms. I was wondering what you saw from the government role to counter that. The video you showed us uh, seemed pretty compelling to me. Is there ever any thoughts in the Justice Department of on occasion, certainly we've done educational things like that, but obviously the Justice Department is in the law enforcement business. I don't, I don't be cute. I've, I've given interviews to the press. I'm here talking about the Microsoft case. I mean, I'm not locked down in some bell jar trying to figure this out or something like that. But it's an entirely different thing from the kind of, you know, mass PR campaign uh, that one can witness by. Uh, private defendants. But but I think we do have an educational function to play in something like this, I do think, would play an important educational uh, function. But we don't spend any money trying to convince the public that I'm a warm and fuzzy guy. I just want to say, first, congratulations. I agree with everything you said about Microsoft. But I think to say that the the, the things that people who violate the antitrust laws do are precisely the same is a little bit, maybe a little soft. Maybe the analogy, particularly I'm thinking of tying, um, the analogy to Polaroid, arguably a little weak, um, particularly in light of the appeals court ruling on the 94 consent decree, um, in light of the fact that these are not physical things that you do bolt together, that they're digital and it's just all code. And I was wondering, I guess two things. One is how critical how critical do you feel it is to the case and to the public that the Justice Department prevail on the tying issue in particular? And if you feel free to comment on your prospects and in light of the 94 consent decree ruling, the, the very stringent standard that the appeals court, which was any plausible benefit, which seems a really tough hurdle to overcome, although I wish you the best. Yeah, uh, 
I think, first of all, I, I think the critical, I think we're going to win the tying count, but the critical counts in the case are the uh, monopoly count uh, on Section 2 monopoly and Section 2 attempt to monopolize the browser market, which are much more integrated uh, and I trust rulings. On tying, the reason I use the Polaroid thing, I don't think that code is so different from everything else in the world, we can't understand it. And the question that we asked in the case and I think the findings of fact are clear on it, is whether the integration of these products creates technological benefit that's not otherwise available. That's what Polaroid did. They integrated film and cameras in a way that created something that you can't create by taking a, a roll of Fuji and a Kodak uh, uh, camera. So that's one thing, and I think that's the question in this case. I think the court's findings are there were no technological benefit to the integration, I think that will stand up even under the Court of Appeals decision. There are distributional benefits, but that's universally true of tying. If I tie film and a camera together and my camera has monopoly power, that will distribute my film more cheaply than if I have to sell it otherwise. But that's no different, and the Court of Appeals talked about bolting, and I feel the court's findings at the trial level support a finding of bolting. Second of all, the finding was in a consent decree case, and more importantly, the Court of Appeal said without, without any findings of fact. This is an entirely different situation, and I, I stand here not, not to pull your chain. I feel confident about it as we go forward, and obviously we'll see how it all sorts itself out. Sir. What do you hope the remedy is going to be in the Microsoft case, and what do you need to do with the well, that's something that at the appropriate time the department will file with the court, and until then it would be premature for me to comment on. But it's going to be, I hope, a remedy commensurate with the violations. It's not before me, and it would be inappropriate. It's before the Federal Trade Commission. It would be inappropriate uh, for me to comment on. It's one of a series of important merges that merits very careful scrutiny by the uh, uh, Justice Department and by the Federal Trade Commission. We have ATT Media One. We have uh, WorldCom MCI Sprint uh, before us right now. We have CBS Viacom. There's a lot going on in our economy, uh, but merger work is the kind of thing you've got to know the facts and do the work. And to have broad cosmic views of it, I think, uh, uh, really won't serve uh, the public. Take one more right there in the front. I really believe that, and that goes to the last gentleman's question about remedy. You've got to have a forward-looking remedy. You don't want to fight yesterday's wars. The critical point, though, is does the company retain monopoly power? And if it does, can it use the same four or five traditional antitrust techniques? Tying, exclusionary contracts, withholding technical information, predatory pricing or predatory expenditures. The, 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 and, and that can be as true with respect to voice recognition as it is with respect to the browser, a going forward technology, if you will. And let me answer your second question. If IE1234, I don't have a horse in that race. If it's a better browser than Netscape, the OEMs will load it in a heartbeat. The, the computer manufacturers, the people who are the information technology people at the major companies in America, they care about the quality of technology. And if they thought one product had a competitive advantage over another, they would certainly load it, consistent with their concerns about switching costs, uh, worker training, and so forth. So there's no reason to think that a superior product won't win out. What's extraordinary about the documents in this case and the court's findings are, over and over it says things like, we cannot win on the merits alone. We need to leverage off our windows monopoly. So I, I think the market is fully capable 
of taking care of these issues, then one would wonder how far this principle of tying goes. Should they be able to bundle Word, Excel, PowerPoint? What, are there no limits? And if that's true, then I go back to the statement from their own COO. What's that signal to the next Netscape? I want to hold the door open, not push anybody through, but hold the door open for the next Netscape for somebody who can come along and create a technology that if it works on the merits, will create the next great technological revolution. And how does that person do that if she or he knows that Microsoft can bundle a version in and have automatic ubiquitous distribution because of Windows? Their own CEO, COO said, if you look at the odds, you're better off not playing the game. That's the wrong message to send to the innovators in America. Thank you all very much.